So Oryx was a spun off from Sun Oil Company okay. in, uh, in 1989 when uh, uh, Sun decided to become a, a pure play uh, uh, refining marketing pipeline company. And so they got rid of the exploration and production part of it and spun us off first as Sun EMP and then we became Oryx okay. Energy Company a year later. And so Oryx, uh, Oryx survived for about 10 years. And so in 19, uh, 1999, um, Oryx was bought by Kerr McGee. So during that time frame that we existed as Oryx, we were doing some subsea work. We were doing, doing a lot of international work. But the main focus that we had was acquisition of deep water leases in the Gulf mm -hmm. of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of shelf properties, a lot of platforms we were operating. But we, uh, but we really saw the future as being in deep water, and so we knew we were going to have to have the, have to have the tools and the people, and the knowledge to be able to do those those jobs, and so, uh, hence the first subsea tieback, and then the stretch on those subsea tiebacks into 2,300 feet of water, with three guys that are just learning how to do this, and uh, and then. Uh, then we, we had had some significant discoveries in Viasca No Lake 26 at Neptune mm -hmm. and had a well out there that we had done, I believe it was two different zones we had tested and uh, um, did what, did drill stem tests on those and together they were over 10,000, it was over 10,000 barrels a day which was one of the largest drill stem tests in the history of the Gulf of Mexico at that time. and. Uh, so we knew we knew we needed to develop this, but the technology that existed at the time uh, was uneconomical for a field that was about 75 million barrels wow. in 1,900 feet of water. Sometimes the the philosophy that we followed, you know, I mean, we we really weren't bashful about taking taking people to the edge of the pier and giving them a little nudge, yeah. and uh, and so. Uh, we had good people around us that understood subsea production and and subsea wells and the ones that had done that. Um, but uh, at the time we did Neptune, you know, no, no one had built uh, production spar number one. And so we started looking at that technology while I was working in California, unknowing to me, our marine technology department, uh, which was one guy, um, his name is Vic Bogus. <laughs> a brilliant mechanical engineer, but he was responsible for following marine technology. Yeah. And that's about the time, 86 or so, is about the time that Ed Horton patented the production spar. Okay. And he formed a joint industry project that included uh, included Sun at the time, uh, um, Amoco and Chevron were all part of that. And so uh, he also brought on board Rama Offshore Contracting as a as a part of his group that would build the first spar, and uh, brought in McDermott to do the engineering and build the first top sides, and brought in Reading and Bates to provide a, the drilling rig had we needed to have a, a, a drilling capable spar, which we did not. So, okay. so when we when we started looking at that uh, in following that as a joint industry project in '86, and. Uh, and then when we came around to the 92, 90, 93 time frame, um, began to look at it and say, well, okay, this is, a, this is 75 million barrels in 1,900 feet of water, and tension leg platform would work in that water depth, but it cost too much. And other, other options is too deep for a, for a fixed leg structure at that time, and so, so Vic Boggess said, well, we've been studying this spar, maybe it's time. That's the thing I think that's been a real, uh, a real success for us at Anadarko and our predecessor companies. You know, many of the people that we're working with in deep water right now are people that joined us back when we were either Sun or Oryx and have stuck, stuck with us through yeah. all of this. But uh, we, uh, you know, uh, I'm an electrical engineer, so the main thing I knew when they asked me to go work on Viasca No Lake 26 and that we were thinking about this floating thing, I knew for sure I didn't know anything at all about what they wanted me to do. It's and a good so, start. Yeah, so, so a little bit of humility and a little bit of, uh, 
a little bit of asking around, trying to surround ourselves with quality people, and so that did know what to do. And so that's been uh, that's been something that I've really enjoyed is the is the people that I've been able to work with through the years, and people like Ed and 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 one of my earlier mentors, Ed Western, that I worked with mm -hmm. in California, taught me about projects and mainly about about ha how to treat a contractor and how to how to bring a contractor on board and and make them a part of what we do. It's not uh, it's not well we we've got this contractor on that job and if they do a bad job we just won't use them anymore. It's you know we approach every job and every discussion with a contractor planning to do job two or job twenty. Yeah. And so we start from day one building a relationship yeah. with those people. Yeah. It it's, like it's, a, it's a partnership. Absolutely. It's not the oil company that, that, that builds these and, and operates these right. facilities. It's, a, it's an army of people. That's right. Um, the, the big selling point was really the ease of fabrication. Okay. And so it's really, you know, it, it's really a big cylinder, particularly, particularly the first one, you know, was like a, like a, uh, a big cylinder. That one was 72 feet in diameter and weighed about uh, had about 7,000 tons of steel in it. So it was uh, uh, 72 feet in diameter and, and uh, 655 feet long. And so when we we built it in Finland in two pieces, transported it over to uh, to Pascagoula, Mississippi, where we joined the two pieces together at the Engel Shipyard and then took it out to to get out to Viascano and uh, um, upended it, and uh, then said that we separately built the top sides and put that on it, and mm -hmm. so the top sides weighed about uh, about 4,000 tons, and so that was a that was a pretty big lift for offshore uh, for the Gulf of Mexico at the time to go set set a 4,000 ton top sides. Mm -hmm. So you, you say ease of fabrication. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that it's very similar to one of the legs of a TLP, just a, a bit bigger, right? Yes. That's one of the cases. Yeah, so that's a good, good it's not example. Like you were building a rocket ship, mm -hmm. but but also perhaps uh, maybe uh, a quicker route to first oil. With, we with a shorter we believe, path time. Yeah, we believe that it would be because what we've done with all of our spars to date is we've uh, we've uh, not we've not built a drilling capable spar because what we prefer to do is to build the top sides and the spar because um, that takes about 18 to 24 months and while we're building that we'll drill the wells get the wells off the critical path uh, whereas if you build an, another type structure or a bigger spar with a rig on it you, you wait 24 months to get the structure out there and then you still have all your drilling to do. Right. And with the depth and the challenges associated with some of today's wells, that can be a significant time period. So, so by getting those wells off the critical path, we really can help accelerate the spar. So, what has Neptune produced over the last 20 years? A um, roundabout figure. Neptune's had a, a best I remember about 125 million barrel celebration. I think was the last. Mm -hmm. So we. So it's really good when you when you can justify a project on 75 million barrels uh, recoverable, and uh, and it and it gives that and keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. It's a good uh, it's a good project. But we've also had multiple subsea tiebacks. So mm -hmm. that's the other thing that we do a lot of is a hub and spoke, where we go out there and we will uh, we'll build a hub and then with that hub then we can reach around. You know, a pretty large uh, geographical area as we find other discoveries in the area. Fascinating.